Well, let's talk about the latest Hassan Reddick trade rumors, plus a way to get $60 million in cap space. Could that mean a DeAndre Swift extension? As well as the Eagles appear interested in drafting a corner. And what's this beef with Jalen Carter and a 49ers O lineman on Twitter? But first, let's run it. What's up guys? Happy Valentine's Day and hopefully you got your special someone something special. Although it turns out that it's Convince Kelsey Day just in case you want to dial up WIP and leave a message for sexy Batman. So if you could just go ahead and get here as soon as possible, that would be terrific. Okay, yeah, that won't do as much as seeing Travis win the Super Bowl because I'm telling you, for someone who has brothers, that no doubt lit a fire in Jason. He's feeling himself and I'm getting pissed off that he's feeling himself. Right. We're out in the backyard and he starts just driving and doing this stupid little hook shot over like his shoulder. It wasn't a hook shot, but like a driving like little whatever that's called. And he is making it every single time and I can't do anything to stop it. So of course I resort to fouling him. The only way I know how to stop it. And he says, that's bullshit. That's a foul. And I'm like, I don't see any refs out here. I don't see anybody calling it. He picks the ball up, throws it at me, goes in the house. I'm like, this mother, did you throw this ball at me? So I go in there. I'd grab him on the shoulder and I'd punch him. And I, this, listen, we would fight all the time. This is the only, twice, the second time I'd ever punched him. I don't know how I got that heated. We, we were competitive in everything. I'm honestly just clinging to whatever might get Jason to come back. However, he said he'll ultimately decide in a couple weeks once he's had time to reflect. And also so that the Eagles will have a better idea of how to move forward in free agency, which is probably why we got the news a few days ago from Ian Rappaport about the birds granting permission to Hassan Reddick to pursue a trade. Except somehow the words got lost in translation or taken out of context, because next thing you know, the narrative shifted to Reddick being unhappy or wanting a trade. Now, I know it's not really breaking news like they posted, yet given the false reporting from other outlets, Jordan Schultz shared that he spoke with Reddick with the All Pro saying, I would like to get an extension done here at home. At no point did I ever tell the organization I want to be traded. This is home for me. I was born and raised here. Two of the most fun years playing football in my life came here. I've cherished being an Eagle. All right, we all love to hear that, and honestly, there was never a moment where I said, oh, Hassan doesn't want to be here. It's obviously about the money, but plus, if you look at this, it's very similar to what Howie Roseman did with Darius Slay, as well as doing it with a couple other free agents. The compelling part is that Haas only has one year remaining on his contract, and zero of it is guaranteed. So understandably, he's also got some pressure to get a deal done. But like the 29-year-old tweeted, he understands it's a business and is preparing for whatever's next. Selfishly, I hope he finds the market a little stale and ends up back in Philly, but I can't fault him at all if he winds up finding a deal that works. I should also mention that Atlanta has been interested according to Liberty Line, as well as PFF linking Houston to a trade and giving up a second round pick for Redick, which I would still lean towards getting a deal done with Haas. However, if you're going to go a different route or look at what you can possibly get for him, I think that anything less than a second round pick, I wouldn't be happy with. I don't know. How about you guys though? What would it take for you to be happy or at least willing to part with Haas. On the flip side, there is a way to keep him and free up about $43 million in cap space, starting by restructuring Hassan Reddick, which would not only allow you to keep your best pass rusher, but also open up $11 million in cap space. Next would be to lose a couple vets in former All-Pro Kevin Byard, saving $14 million if cut post-June 1, and Avante Maddox, who just can't stay healthy, freeing up another seven. The fourth option is restructuring left tackle Jordan Mailata to create $2.5 million, and then an extension of Josh Sweat brings it up another $2.5 I get his lack of sack production late, but the 26-year-old finished with the 18th most pressures in the league. After that, Howie can restructure tight end Dallas Goddard as well as kicker Jake Elliott to give you another $4 million. And then the most important extension is getting a deal done with Devontae Smith, especially with wide receivers CeeDee Lamb and Justin Jefferson soon to reset the market. By the way, that would likely give you another $2 million this season. And finally, by extending Landon Dickerson and Milton Williams, you add one more mil to the total. So taking that to the current 23 million in cap space, you add that together and it's about 67 million. Okay, well, could that be enough to re-sign DeAndre Swift? No, probably not, because for starters, Howie doesn't value running backs, and he's given the second lowest amount of money to running backs since 2017. But that strategy's been really efficient because the Eagles have had the third most rushing yards in the NFL during that span. On the other side, Swift is only 25 with at least a couple years of productivity left. And seeing how the Philly native finished with a career year over 1,000 yards, ranking fifth in the NFL, while also making the Pro Bowl, perhaps how he changes his ways. Although, like I've talked about before, seeing Miles Sanders leave last season for a $25 million deal followed by an incredibly disappointing season of 432 yards and losing the starting job in Carolina probably only adds to the status quo. 
Plus, the rest of the league seems to be catching on as well, with the last 10 Super Bowl winners featured running back not being worth more than $2 million. So check it. 2014 Patriots Jonas Gray was the leading rusher of 412 yards on the team with a 271,000 cap hit. Then 2015, the Broncos had Ronnie Hillman at a 942,000 cap hit. 2016 was the Patriots LeGarrette Blunt with a $1 million cap hit. 2017, obviously we know very well, LeGarrette Blunt again though with a $1.25 million cap hit. And then 2018, the Patriots Sony Michelle. The 2019 Chiefs featured Damian Williams. And then 2020 for the Bucks was Ronald Jones, followed by the 2021 Rams and Sony Michelle. And finally, the 2022 Chiefs and 2023 Chiefs of both being Isaiah Pacheco. Anyway, so as much as I'd love to keep him, Smart Money says Agent Zero is gone. Although it does look like the birds could be changing things up at cornerback, since Jake Rabati reported that the Eagles met with Louisville cornerback Jarvis Brownlee Jr. at the Senior Bowl, which if you're not familiar with Brownlee, outside the birds shared that if you're a fan of physical cornerbacks that aren't afraid to hit, then you should be very happy that the Eagles met with the Louisville cornerback. Or there's also Toledo's Quinion Mitchell, who's the second of 10 cornerbacks the Eagles have met with so far, who racked up 37 pass breakups over the last two seasons and boasts a sub 4-4 speed. This dude's just a gamer and I'd love to get him in Philly. Or there's also Missouri cornerback Ennis Rakestraw, who they haven't met with yet but would be very appealing, especially looking at the PFF write-up on him. Since he's an incredibly smart and savvy off-coverage cornerback, before the plays are even snapped, you can see evidence of his football IQ with his pre-snap communication and adjustments to motion. He does most of his work in off-coverage, cover three, quarters, and underneath zones, and does so beautifully, showing excellent spacing and ability to pass off routes with ease. Now, it's worth noting that he didn't really play a whole lot of press coverage or man coverage, and it'll be interesting to see how he does at the combine with his measurables. However, considering the Fangio scheme, this is definitely a player to keep your eye on. Either way, if you want any of those dudes, Howie's going to have to do something he hasn't done in six years, and that's take a corner within the first three rounds. Which, speaking of first, that's actually a good segue into the sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by SeatGeek, and with over 28 million downloads, it's no wonder they're the number one rated ticketing app. I actually remember the first time I ever used SeatGeek was whenever I was in New York and I went to Derek Jeter's last game at Yankee Stadium. I don't know, there's just nothing that beats attending an event in person. Oh yeah, I forgot about this one with my bro Dave at the Elite Eight. His reaction to that buzzer beater was priceless. But man, not much tops the 27 beatdown we put on Dallas, especially getting to go with my twin bro Kaylee. What do y'all think? Can you tell the difference? The best part with SeatGeek though is that you can certainly tell the difference about a good deal versus a bad deal. For example, each ticket is rated on a scale of 1 to 10, with the green dots being good, like Joel Embiid, and the red dots meaning bad, like Daryl Morey's trade deadline. Sorry, there's no guarantee on the Sixers' future. However, you're in luck in case, you know, let's say, for example, you bought tickets to an event that you really no longer care to go to. Every ticket with SeatGeek is backed by a buyer's guarantee, and they're the only site that allows you to return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. And you know I came through for you guys, so use my code PHILLY for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase with promo code PHILLY. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. All right, let's get into this Jalen Carter and John Feliciano drama. So first off, where this thing started was 49ers guard John Feliciano blaming teammate Spencer Burford for missing the protection for Brock Purdy that would have most likely resulted in an easy touchdown to Brandon Ayuk. To which Burford then responded saying, sheesh, I opened up my app to get this? Get well soon, bro. And then Feliciano tried to play it off saying he's sorry and woke up hungover, it's effed up, while apologizing and saying, you got nothing but greatness ahead of you. And I'm sorry, bro. My pops taught me that a man who talks behind somebody's back is a coward. Wow, I actually appreciate that. Good, because I'm going to tell you directly to your face. No, you don't have to. No, I don't like you. Okay, I mean, he did post it publicly to social media. I mean, that's exactly what social media is, so I'm not sure what he thought was going to happen. By the way, Burford liked a tweet from an individual saying, that sounds about right from Feliciano, which I think is kind of hilarious just seeing the fallout from the Weiner Super Bowl loss. However, this next part is a little more serious, with Jalen Carter jumping into the conversation saying, Feliciano is the same dude who spoke on my dead teammate and the reason I was emotional during our game. Remember, that's whenever we saw Jalen Carter in tears on the sideline, which understandably so if that was the case. Of course, the 49ers O-Lami responded by saying, dude told me he was gonna murder me and my kids would never see me again three times because I was laughing at him after getting a flag. I said, I believe you, you got a body. Then he continued for weeks posting my fam and reaching out to my friends. And then JC responded saying, bro must be drunk and Feliciano just gonna keep pushing the narrative of being a murderer, but that Jalen's just trying to be the best ever and some people are just trying not to get traded. Then leading to JC getting blocked by Feliciano before the Niner was called out for not having evidence, but then shared an apparent DM from Carter that read, I'm your biggest fan, I'll get up with you." which was then followed up by Feliciano saying, the NFL has all the receipts. I'm past all this though. I hope the best for him. I take responsibility for my part. 
Okay, normally this might be a part for me to insert a funny clip or a joke or something like that. However, I'm not all about anything that has to do with death threats or getting family involved or anything like that. Now, I will say that I agree with Anthony that in all seriousness, the Eagles played the Niners on December 3rd. If Feliciano is claiming that Jalen Carter made threats and brought it up to the NFL, wouldn't there have been some type of report or decision made over the course of the last two months? I don't know. I mean, I understand that investigations take forever and sometimes you're not able to say anything. However, like Anthony says, something would have come out. I mean, take a look at all the reports that we've seen over the last several weeks or months or everything through the season. It was filled with drama. This surely would have come out. But again, who really knows? All right. Curious to get y'all's thoughts on it. And on a lighter note, we're going to have some draft content coming soon, as well as going live as soon as any breaking news breaks. So do me a favor and hit that sub button if you haven't already. Until next time, this has been the Philly Special.